The following presentation is brought to you live from Dallas, Texas, for the 26th Annual International Association of Square Dance Callers Annual Convention. This is tape four. Find them. Where do they come from? This is my 50th year of calling. And so we've had an opportunity to see a lot of people do a lot of things very well, and also some things that are problems. So let's talk about at least three different groups of people that are involved in this business of going out and finding p people to get them into square dancing. One's my school kids. I work with thousands of school kids all over Northern California. Had 11, have 1,100 kids in just one junior high. So you can imagine we have uh, lots and lots of school programs going, and they go very well. We've got some super ones. Uh, uh, we'll have one coming up uh, when I get back after a week uh, for second graders. Uh, I don't know of anybody who's ever tried to put together a big festival for second graders any place in the country. But we have now are into our sixth year of this one. And last year we had almost a thousand second graders at the deal. We'll be having one in April, another one in May. It's so big now. I have to have two different days in the biggest building in our county. Um, so that's one interesting group of people that most folks don't even think about. And we're talking about all the school programs. We have this one for second grade as a result of a program from kindergarten, first and second. And then we have our second grade jamboree. We're now starting one for fourth and fifth grade in another county. Deborah Parnell will be come up to help me call that one. And did last year, we had a fabulous time. So uh, schools, school kids, programs that are involved with organized groups like that. A second group that uh, I'll have to stop and think a bit, got me off here. Uh, the people of China. I've been working now uh, for over six years with uh, helping the people in China learn how to call and dance. I made a very big error when I started over there. Um, the people I work with in China are the performing artists of China, the best dancers in the world, some of them, fabulous people. But they all know that this is the American folk dance, and they're into folk dancing. And here's the one they can do from the United States. They've got one from Israel, from Greece, all over the place. This is the United States folk dance. And so the Chinese people want to know how to do it. Even though they can't speak English, they do speak square dance language. It takes quite a while to get that over and get them to learn it. But anyway, that's a second group of people that most folks wouldn't think about going to a foreign country, some place where they've never heard of square dancing. And I tell them that I want them to use my diamond program, maybe the basic program we'll get to someday. And uh, uh, I want them to keep that program going till they can show me a million dancers. When they can show me they've got a million people in square dancing, then we're going to try to go to China and have a big festival in Tiananmen Square. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. So you have large, large numbers of school kids. You have large, large numbers of people in China who are good dancers. They're fabulous dancers. You just watch them and you're amazed because they're all trained professional dancers, the words we work with. So that's two of those categories, and I'll have to think a little bit to get back with a third one for you. But the main idea here is to have you think about places where kids, uh, people might be available uh, to come into your classes and start square dancing. Now let me give you uh, one other example. About two weeks ago, I was invited to a square dance uh, near our community. And I went, this was the second year I've been up for that. And here at this one hall was a whole bunch of alumni, Stanford class of 1954 medical school. Once a year, 
since that time, they had their own square dance club on campus at Stanford, and a caller there with them who's become one of the physicians. He's now retired. And uh, uh, so here were these guys, and they regularly, every year, people come from all over the country to dance one dance, I mean, one night of dancing. First time I'd heard Shoot the Moon or Die for the Birdie in the Cage and Take a Peek for a long, long time. He's still calling what he called in 54. And uh, so the key thing is there's a whole lot of people in square dancing. I, uh, I work with many, many, many uh, schools and the adults that are there. We'll have the kids put on a little exhibition for them, and then all the kids go out and help me, and we teach the adults uh, a little about it and have a great time. So the key thing is there's a whole lot of people square dancing, but they're not square dancing what we want to do. Uh, they don't uh, join our programs. They don't want our programs. And I think you have to think a lot about why is it we can get all these people in China, we can get all these kids from all over the country, and we can get other groups of people who just love to square dance, uh, but we can't get them to come and join in our classes. And so when we ask the question, where do they come from, you need to think that through kind of carefully and see if you can identify some places we're missing the opportunity to bring into our square dance groups people who would love to be part of our groups and uh, yet aren't. Uh, I think that uh, the other thing in terms of getting this started is just to understand that probably none of us has enough experience to be able to anticipate all the kinds of opportunities you have. You may have somebody call at the last minute and say, we're going to try something new this year at the county fair, and we'd like you to bring some people and, and set up a nice little program for us. Uh, can't tell what's going to happen. People are wonderful about doing that. They know square dancing exists, and they know it's a lot of fun. And so uh, there's just many opportunities that go along with uh, being part of this. So let me kick this off with a kind of an introduction to the fact that we truly may not be thinking about many of the groups of people that would love to get in square dancing. You have to be careful about that, though. I, uh, I'm one of these teachers that when I teach, I teach by the book. And uh, it's about well, several years ago, I got very brave. I had some junior highs that were dancing great, really having a good time. And so I said, I want to take you down to the state convention, to the teenage room. Well, I don't know what it's like now, but in those days, that's quite a while ago, the teenage room at the square dance convention was not the place for anybody who was normal. <laughs> it, it just meant I put all, took all my kids in there and mixed them up with people who were doing so many odd wall things they lasted one tip and turned around and walked out of the room and didn't want to be back there anymore at all. They weren't dancing anything uh, by definition. They were just dancing it the way the teenagers do to have a good time. And so if you're going to get involved with schools or with uh, programs like that, you need to be very sure that you know well the group you're getting involved with. I brought some of our people from China over and I found an amazing interest in our local clubs to helping us with that project. We went to several of them and said, these people coming from China only know the first 20 calls. That's all we've taught them. And I'd like to find some programs where the dance, well, the evening will change their whole program all night long uh, to use only the first 20 calls. I didn't have a single person turn me down. I must have had eight or ten dances that I could take these folks to. All night long, they danced the calls they knew. They had a fabulous time, and everybody loved having him come with them. So you have to think a little bit about trying to identify where people are coming from, what they're doing, this kind of thing. Now, I'm going to take just a minute and introduce uh, Dana. 
Well, yeah, you do be first, huh? Okay. Dane is from Barrington, Kansas. He has three mainstream clubs, one plus club and one advanced club. Teaches lots and lots of lessons. Is chairman of the basic and mainstream program. Dana? Thank you, Dad. First of all, I want to thank you all for coming to this session. I know you have a lot of choices you could come to, and uh, we appreciate you being here. I also appreciate the fact I'm getting to work with uh, Jack and, and Mike here. A very fine gentleman I've admired for years. Uh, if it sounds like I'm nervous, it's probably because I am. I'm not used to getting up before a group of people and talking. Just I'm used to calling dances, much like most of you are, I'm sure. Um, but the other side of it is I'm excited that we're actually talking about something that is very important to me, recruiting new dancers, finding those dancers. So, as we said before, if you have a question or a comment you'd like to make, please feel free to come forward. Uh, if you'd like to agree with anything I say, we'd like to have it on tape. If you want to disagree with anything I say, please go next door. <laughs> we'll try to make it as fast as we can. We, um, we have a lot of things to cover, and I'll just kind of read through the best I can here. We've been hearing for years that the programs are our major problems, and for years I've been saying, no, it's not the problem, it's just the way we recruit people. It's the way we market our activity. And I think uh, Jim was telling us that this morning. We have to look at score dancing as a unique activity, and uh, there's nothing wrong with what we do in score dancing. There's nothing wrong other than people have a perception about us that we're from the e hall days and things like that. They also are not hearing about us, mainly because we're not marketing ourselves to the average people anymore. We've, we've relied on years, people going to their friends and saying, hey, you want to try square dancing? That worked 30 years ago. Now people are actually scared to go ask or scared to tell people about square dancing because there, there's so many companies out there right now utilizing network marketing where they call people at night, confront them about different opportunities they can get into, that now they are starting to get leery about anything where it's a good deal. So when a person gets a phone call saying, hey, would you like to call, go to a score dance? Uh, it can't be that good. No, we better not. Because they're, used to, they're programmed themselves to say no to everything, a good opportunity that might come along. Uh, Jerry Hilt last year made a very interesting point, and I thought it was very appropriate for this. How many people receive phone calls at night soliciting telephone, long distance service, all kinds of stuff? Every night you get them. About the time you're sitting down for supper. Well, Jerry came up with a unique ideal. Turn the tables on those people. As soon as they identify themselves and what they're trying to sell, turn around and say, well, I'm sure glad you called. I've been wanting to talk to somebody about square dance lessons. And square dancing so much fun and so good for you. Turn the tables on. Every time they try to go back to their sales pitch, turn it back to score dancing. It, you probably wouldn't get anybody to buy off that, but at the same point in time, it does make an interesting conversation for the person when he goes home that night. Okay? So I thought it was a very uh, unique uh, opportunity type thing for Jerry to come up with. There's also all kinds of activities out there. We're seeing more and more as we go along. It's not just limited to the few things we used to know 30 years ago, bowling and, and things like that. Now it's just expanding. Those with school kids know how much the, the high schools have expanded their activity list. They cannot no longer go to a, um, go home and expect to sit at home. They're gonna go out and do something at night with the kids, band practice, rehearsal, whatever. There's always something to do with the school kids. So it's hard for the families to, to schedule an activity such as score dancing. I think one of the biggest obstacles we have now too is the fact that nowadays husband and wives both work. And they're not, most companies are not asking people to work 40 hours a week. They're asking them to work 15, 60 hours a week. So when you see those people go home at night, the last thing you want to do is go out. They want to go home, put their feet up, and rest. It used to be the husband worked 40 hours, the wife said, let's go dance tonight, and they went. But now, like I said, they're pretty much wore out by the time they get home, and they need that extra time at home 
just to relax, get things caught up, get the chores done, and so forth. So that's interfering with some of the activities we see during the week. Public perception. Again, we mentioned that. There's a lot of people out there who doesn't really understand what score dancing is. We have to change that. We have to determine a way that we can actually sell score dancing. When you see people out in their score dance attire, in their clothing, in their um, various pretty dresses and so forth, how do they react to the public? How do they perceive, how does the public perceive them? And if they don't come across as being friendly people like they are at the dances, then people are going to be shunning square dancers away. They stereotype those people as being, or well, they're going to cause trouble, or they're, they're unique type people, and they're not, they're not really interested in us. They have to be, when they're out in the public, they have to be salesmen. They have to be, when they're wearing their score dance wardrobes, they have to learn how to sell their sales to the public. There's a club down in Houston, I won't mention the name, but that I'm uh, aware of, where the, the dancers dance until 9 o'clock, they go to a restaurant, when they get done, they go to that restaurant, they have all their announcements there, their birthdays, anniversaries, welcoming the guests, everything's done at that restaurant. They include the, the, the non-dancing people, the patrons of the restaurant, they include them with their announcements. They actually, the dancers actually serve the coffee and tea as they go through. And it's, it's a good public perception. They have non-dancers come every night, they have a club dance to the restaurant because they know there's going to be some fun going on at that restaurant. That's a good political statement for square dancing. I'm sure it goes well for the restaurant too. So, you know, it's just one of those things. If you, if you go in there and complain to the waitresses and don't give them tips and so forth, they're going to pass that information. Square dancers are a bunch of cheapies. But if you go in there and have fun with them and enjoy the evening just as like you do at square dancing, it's going to sell square dancing to the whole kinds of people. So we have to keep that in mind. Okay, got a long ways to go yet. <laughs> Where do we find new dancers? That's the whole goal here. Basically, we got to get out and start making our plans. We have to make a plan to attack the marketing place. Sit down with your clubs. Set a goal. How many people can we should we expect for this lesson? And not only for the whole club, individual goals. How many people should we have each person bring? Can we get you to commit to one couple? Sit down with those people and have them. If they have a goal to reach they'll be more apt to do it. Then reward those goals. If they maintain it, give them something back in it. Have, if you set a goal of 10 couples for the club, they come in with 10, have a pizza party for the whole club. Something like that, where they get a reward back. That helps. Uh, identify the uh, various organizations out there that have prospective members, such as singles organizations, uh, church organizations. They're always looking for something to do why not treat them to some activity such as score dancing as a taste, as a party night or something that will help sell that activity. So identify who those organizations might be, whether it be churches, schools, or whatever. Offer free nights to the 4-H clubs, recreation centers, and um, also contact your single organization. A lot of churches have single uh, groups. Good place to get singles involved. Also put an ad in, in the personal section of the, of the paper saying, you want to meet the right person, come to score dancing. It's a good way to get people in. We've done that. Um, one couple more points I want to make before I have to turn it over to Mike. Oh, I heard of a club recently, in Oklahoma I believe it was, that they, um, they did their demonstration like they, most clubs do, but they put up a poster saying, register for $100 worth of free square dance lessons. I had 200 people sign up. So they took those names, put out an invitation to all these 200 names, saying, we're having a Western party night. Please come. The drawing will be held then. You must be in attendance to win. They had 140 people show up. Had a good time. They did just line dances, country dancing, a little bit of sport dancing, a little polka, whatever. Had just a good time. Members came casual with finger foods and so forth. Of that, then they had the drawing, they announced, hey, we're going to start square dance lessons next week. Seventy of those people showed up for square dance lessons. They started a new set of lessons right after that. They had uh, 90 people show up for the next set of lessons. That's a way to get people interest. Just get them to come one night. 
They thought they were winning a hundred dollars with a pre score dance lesson, and they one person did, but everyone else came and had fun. Okay. I think one important thing that's going on right now, and one I'm very happy to be a part of, is multiple lesson sessions. Tomorrow there'll be a, a session on that, and um, we'll see in Embassy East at 10:45, and Mike uh, Mike Seastrom <laughs> and myself and Nassar Chukar will be discussing multiple lesson sessions. That is where you actually start classes ongoing. You have one as one gets about halfway through, you start a new one. The people in classes right now are your best sales people. They have the most enthusiasm. So it's a good sales ticket, and we hope that you'll come tomorrow and learn how it works. Okay? Uh, I've got several other things, but I'm going to kind of let it go. I do have some some handouts down here. There is um, a booklet I do not have extra copies of that's talking about recruiting and keeping new dancers put out by the United Square Dance of America folks. Lyle, could you tell me how to get a hold of that? Yeah, put you on, on the mic so they can get it on tape. United Square Dancers of America have much material that's available, and it's all available free on the internet. Most of it in hard copy is available. One like this, we charge like three dollars for printing and and shipping. But if you're on the internet, just go to USDA dot org o r g and you can copy any of that off of the off of the uh, internet there. Thank you, that's Lyle Beck with the USDA. Also you have a little pamphlet, I'm sure most of you have seen the Color Lab Foundation pamphlet. These are about 10 cents each, very professionally done. I recommend that to put out to Chamber of Commerce, Recreation Centers and so forth. Put your name on the back, it has all the information you need about score dancing. Uh, speaking of the foundation, if you do not already do it, I would encourage you to donate to the Color Foundation, Color Lab Foundation. That's what the money's for, is for promoting score dancing and recruiting. And with that, I'll turn the mic back over. I'll have some probably other comments later on. Yes, very, very nice of um, uh, these guys to prepare all this. I want you to meet Mike over here. Mike's going to have some handouts for you afterward also. So I'll just turn this over to Mike. <laughs> I love competing with Beverly Hillbillies. Actually, not after, during. Uh, if you can just start passing those out, uh, the the yellow and the so forth. There's two interesting things to draw from both Jack and Dana's presentations. Jack said, you know, we can we can affect second graders, we can affect whole nations somewhere else, but it's a matter of changing how we do what we do. Dana talked about all kinds of different ways to recruit people into square dancing, but it was a matter of changing our attitude about what was going on. The topic says today for this particular session is where do they come from? The answer is everywhere, and it's a matter of changing how we go about getting those people to come into square dancing. Talk to me here. Did any of you do one night stands this year separate from the initial first night of lessons. A number of you did. Did you do more than 10 this year? Very good. Now, the question is, is how did you get those events to, to be done? Did you go out and recruit those events or did those events come to you? Let me see a raising of hands for those that were the event came to you and asked you to do the one night stand. Okay? Now, I would like to see a raising of hands of how many people experienced a number of events where you went out and recruited the one night stand. Much less. There's the attitude change that needs to be done. But the question becomes is, well, how do I go ahead and do this? What is being passed out amongst you right now are three sheets of events that I got off of the news service clippings of the internet. All of them are begging for some kind of social activity to go on with their event. If you look first off at the yellow sheet, the yellow sheet is from Lombard, Illinois. Lombard, Illinois decided that all the hoopla for the Millennium New Year's Eve celebration was going to be too big and a non-family oriented situation to have their activities based on. 
So they're going to spread them out from July until, Jan until January 1st to do all kinds of family-oriented events. It's not like up our field and up our alley, and they're begging at the bottom for a number for somebody to call with other activities. You look down at the green sheet. The green sheet deals with Allentown, Pennsylvania having a affair where they're touring all the different restaurants in Allentown. And they too are begging for other activities to go on with the event that they're doing. If you look at the blue sheet, and that's even more interesting, the blue sheet was also one of several other listings that was on the internet, were on the internet, all dealing with college campuses wanting to have events on campus that were non-alcoholic oriented. That they're trying to get away from the frat parties and those events that were all alcohol based and get into a different type of activity with the people that are on campus, the students, the people that are 17 to 21, the people we never seem to see on our floors, and they're begging to see things to come up in front of their group. This particular listing is from the Washington Post, so we're not talking about the Podunk Times here. And the references that I saw on the internet were not just to some small college somewhere, but to Dartmouth, Dartmouth and the University of Maryland. They're begging for activities. Are we going out and selling ourselves there as a solution to their problem? Probably not, as the number of hands that were shown here by being raised. In every part of the country for New Year's Eve celebrations, and what's interesting is this is not a national organization producing it, it's a grassroots organization at every different part of the country, and I only have one of these, is first night events. I don't know if you've uh, been introduced to any of these in your area. They are non-alcoholic, family-oriented activities to celebrate the New Year and that was on New Year's Eve. It's done early in the evening. It wouldn't even interfere with one of your own New Year's Eve dances to go out and do some of this kind of stuff. This particular instance in Red Bank, New Jersey, if you would like to pass this amount or look at it, the, this particular instance in, in New Jersey was being done by Roy and Betsy Gata. Uh, Betsy does a 15-minute shtick. Why? Because there's events scattered out through the entire town People get on buses and go from event to event to event. It's like a smorgasbord of events, so you only sample a little. So she does a 15-minute routine. She doesn't do the traditional two hours, this is my dance, and they're coming in the door to do this only for the evening. She realizes that she's competing with 30 other things. So she makes up her situation to cover a 15-minute segment and that the next crew of people that come in by bus get to learn it over again, except that she does a little bit different each and every time because some people get captured by the activity and they stay on for the next tip or they stay on again. And so she does the same stuff because uh, obviously we've got to teach element less somewhere along the way, but she does something different each time so it's worth the while of people that do decide to stay. At the same time, she doesn't abandon anybody that keeps coming in by the bus. She changed what she did. She changed her attitude. And interestingly enough, she was hired by these people. She's being well paid, too. So we don't have to give up anything to, in order to be able to counter a whole new group of people. But it's a matter of going out there and start selling the activity as opposed to waiting for them to discover us. And that's what we seem to have perpetually done with one night stands. Typically, either you or you've heard of somebody who gets the phone call of two weeks ahead of time. And if it sounds interesting enough, you'll do the one night stand. But more often than not, you pass it on to somebody you know that isn't quite as busy as you are. And that's the attitude that we've had constantly, people who come knocking on our door. We've never knocked on their doors at all. And so these are instances of saying, well, where do I start knocking on doors? Pick up the darn computer, turn it on, and you'll find these things all over the place, of places that are looking for other activities to participate with their activities. And if you change the methodology by which you do things, you can adapt and be part of this whole environment. Of, of, we are seeing by three different situations here where they are begging for non-alcoholic related family-oriented activities. It sounds like us, and yet we're not participating. I mean, it's obvious in the description that's going on there that square dancing isn't being mentioned. Um, the one-nighter, again, is another methodology. But let's also talk about your normal square dance situation, the club that you're at, the location that it's working at, whether it's a church or a school, or if you're in the shopping center, mall, uh, utility, community room, or so forth. 
uh, with me as many of my square dance weekends. I have gone at the weekends that I conduct, since many of them are in hotels or campground locations where you've got non-dancers there, I do a 15 minute to 30 minute one night stand. Now, first off, it has a, a, a side effect that's really positive. I get dancers who are very active to be a participant in the one night stand because as long as they're there and you do this before the night session starts, I do a little stick from 7 to 7.30 where the people that are there that have been looking in on your event all day, they've heard the music, they come by, they look, they stare, sometimes they point, but we take the time to see if we can get them back at 7 o'clock that evening where, hey, we'll teach you a little bit of this. And our experienced dancers get to finally angel and recruit again. Now, it doesn't matter that, that I'm doing this in some other part of the country because we need to have a community view of square dancing. Not that what does it get for me, but what does it get for the activity. I know that by the 10 or 12 of these that I did last year, that four people joined lessons. They never joined my lessons. I don't even know where they're at. I did hear back by from other people that they joined lessons. And that's where they hit square dancing was my one night stand that I did for them there. But we have always seen when we work a square dance at a church or a square dance at a school and that school or church has another activity, they peek in and look. But do we take the time to welcome them in the door, explain what's going on? Do we train our dancers to like go for the throat, sick those people? I mean, they're, they're as far as the point of looking at us. You know, we, it's not a case of hitting and calling somebody cold at home or going out and, 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 and accosting them at a mall. It's, they've gotten to the point where they've actually got in the door and have live square dancers in front of them. Do we sell? Probably not. And we don't do it as an organized effort. And so here's a situation, a scenario where we need to rethink how we do our events. Is that find out if the church that you're dancing at has some other activity going on there at the same time or the school and if there is something go speak to those people or see if there's some other event you can come in and work with them some other time sell the dance activity but you have to be aggressive and assertive about it the final thing I want to say and particularly a lot of what I do is in advance and challenge the advance and challenge dancers are real converted nuts about square dancing I mean let's face it that's why they're at that point what they're doing and they always tell us, well, we don't have time to recruit beginners. Well, let's not beat up on them for not recruiting us beginners. Let's beat up on them and say, okay, you do do something else with your life. You go to church, you buy things, you do things, you participate in other organizations besides square dancing. Get us in the door. Go to your group that else that you belong to and ask them if they can do a, a one night stand, some beginner dance or whatever. Tell them they don't even have to come to it. All they gotta do is get us in the doorway of some other place. Again, it's another methodology of selling the activity and it's us being aggressive salespersons instead of waiting for somebody to get on the phone and call us about it. And I would like to introduce Jim Hensley, who you met this morning, who has some more theoretical things to be able to talk about in this regard because he did that in front of the board yesterday. And Jim, if you'd like to take over the microphone here, it would be wonderful. <laughs> well, I, I think you had a couple of examples that you used in the board meeting of this type of scenario that, that I think do a better job of drawing a conclusion. Or one. I, 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 I have a badge. Yeah, yeah just real quick. A uh, minute. Not on our panel, but a, a real fortunate opportunity for us is to have a marketing expert in our area, and he's going to take a few minutes because that's so germane to the tr the topic we have, trying to find people for square dancing, who they are, where they come from. So. Let me, uh, this is Jim Hensley. Pleasure to meet you. I have you here. All right, well, here you go. I have a box over. Oh, yeah. Just, just, yeah, yeah. Uh, you really, I uh, thank you very much. Like I say, I, I didn't, uh, couldn't spell it. And um, uh, unfortunately, I, I, I woke up in time to go to, go to the morning assembly and, and, and I got caught. So that, that was kind of extemporaneous there and this is also I just uh, 
One quick thing. I, someone just had me a pencil, and it's really neat. Physical and mental exercise and sociability. Try square dancing. Uh, it's friendship set to music. Uh, all the good stuff you've heard, but they pass out pencils. I know a lot of you have done this kind of stuff. I guess the point I really wanted to make is that you you don't have any idea how important a physical aspect and mental aspect square dancing is. I don't. I, I take a newsletter, a nutritional newsletter, which is one of the best in the country, and uh, they just did a study. Uh, they spent $10 million of your money to try to solve a problem called mental orientation, or what they call spatial orientation. All of us start to lose it after the age of about 35. And they spent $10 million, came up with a whole wonderful three hours worth of exercises that if you'll do it every day, it keeps some of the neuron tracks open in your mind. And then somebody went out and found out that you get exactly the same result from square dancing for two and a half to three hours. You know, they could have saved the $10 million. But the reason I make this point is that we talk about our concerns about our physical well-being, and that's what everyone is interested in. And we talk about that, and we all know that this is great exercise. What we don't talk about but what we really worry about is our mental well-being. These are the things that we really worry about, and this is the level of motivation for a lot of people. So don't discount this idea that we know now that, that, uh, that you, you know, you used to not be able to use this kind of a, an approach because it was too esotistical, it was, it was too etherical, it was too off the board, this energy thing. But now, one out of every three Americans last year went out of their way to use what we call the non-normal medical practices. The, the, the acupuncture and acupressure and aromatherapy. One out of every three Americans paid out of their pockets because the insurance doesn't cover all this stuff yet. So this is not a field. To talk about when you walk into a, a room with a good caller and the energy aspect and the value of that energy and the value of touching, these are all things that used to, you couldn't talk about and it were, people thought you were nuts. But now this is mainstream. This is no longer uh, fringe anymore. So. You're again in, in that kind of activity. Uh, the thing that, uh, in listening to this, it really made a lot of sense is what, he, what I hear Mike saying, which is, is dead on, is proactive is the term we use. And you've got to be proactive not just as a caller. You have to teach and you have to know a way to get your, that, that, that membership of dancers to be proactive. Because the caller proactive and the dancer proactive is no longer a choice. We're entered, we've entered uh, in the last five to ten year period a cycle of competitive nature in the marketplace that doesn't allow this, this activity to continue. It will not survive if you don't become proactive, as he's just suggested very, very wonderfully. And it doesn't, it, be, believe it or not, uh, I talk to, you just don't understand the product you have and the value it has and how politically correct it is. Uh, a friend of mine was on the group of choreographers that did river dance. I'm sure you've all seen river dance. And we were talking about this. I said, geez, I've got to come up with a river dance for a square. He said, do you have any idea how hard it is to, to build a successful, nationally acclaimed, and internationally re received dance around a dance in which you can't even move anything from the waist up? And that's what Irish dancing is. And, and, and they had to change things and modify things. But look what they did with the dance. It's not one fraction of what you have going. He said, you, he said if you ever get ready to do that, let me know. I'll have a ball. You know, we'll have an Americana Folklorico a river dance that'll, that are, that'll be ten times better than this river dance. So in every aspect, the product is there. What you now have to know is that it's not any longer possible to just sit back, passively accept this as a social activity. You have a product. And this product, is, as Mike has said, has to become something that you're proactive on in the way you approach it as a caller. No choices. But it's fun choices because you're dealing, you're dealing with a product in which there's no downside. I mean, you don't understand in the, in the public relations business how many times we have to take products that we know are not exactly the way they would like to have them appear or people or things like that that have downsides. You don't have any downside on this thing. This activity offends no one. And you've got to understand it in this, in this marketplace today, being politically correct is more important than having the product work well. It is more important. And when you, when you do what he suggested doing, whether it's going to schools or churches or anything else, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, I've done, you know, fundraisers for this thing. I, I built a lot of dinner theaters, did work in, uh, did a program for the National Dinner Theater Association. 
and we had we re ran dinner theaters on fundraisers. We that from Monday through through Saturday night, well, that's how we made our money. And we sat down and we found all the non-profit organizations and profit organizations, uh, clubs, uh, you know, the the paralegal wives, or whatever it happens to be. Within a five mile radius of where we were located, we found two thousand organizations. And guess what these organizations have in common? They have meetings every year. And guess what else they have in common? They have a fundraiser or they have a social activity every year. Every year, every one of these clubs has to find a way. And you know what they do? They appoint some guy, someone who has to be in charge of the program for that year. And this guy is going crazy. And you know what he's really looking for? He's looking for something that's socially acceptable, that doesn't offend anybody. They may have extreme left-wing people in one part of the... Of this organization they may have very conservative people on the other side of this organization and they're trying to figure out that's why dinner theater worked because they defended no one but guess what works better square dancing every club of any type of any organization always has to have meetings and you can provide as you said i love the idea of, of having the meeting in a public place we used to have the dinner theater and they we said you can hold your meeting here just before we give you a cocktail hour or whatever it happens to be and so they saw this as an opportunity, and then they raised funds through it. Well, the same thing can be done with, with, with this activity very effectively. The other side of this thing is your, your community of dancers, your population of dancers, your folks can no longer sit back and see this not as a product themselves. They have to become active in this. You know, it comes down to one basic question, folks. There's only one problem that has to be solved. And all of us have only one thing that we can really control, and that's our choices. And everyone has to choose now, today, every day, all over again, on whether or not they want to make square dancing important enough to continue. And that's really what it's about. That's what every person sits down in marketing every day. How do you think one product, you ever come back from the, from the store and have a product in your hand and you suddenly think, you know, you may not analyze it this way, but you, in, in a sense you're saying, I wonder if that advertising of this product was better than the product itself and that's why I've got it because I really don't need it we have to make this product more important in a sense than it really is not to you folks because you make your living in it and because you're dedicated enough to go out and become specially trained professional people but for the average person they have to find a way to help you make this more important than it really is and it really is if you understand that double that double take it, we're finding it becomes more important all the time. Uh, you don't understand also historically how the trend now is going back to heritage and the use of heritage and all of the stuff that we used to throw away, whether it's oak wood furniture in the Midwest or whatever, and that's all coming back. And with this is an appreciation of heritage. And there isn't any dance in America that has the heritage you, you folks have. I don't want to take any more time, but I, I, I just, I can't emphasize enough proactive as a caller, and then you have to find a way to motivate and educate your dance population to be just as proactive, because there isn't any other solution except to decide that this is important enough to work for. Oh, great. There's a point I'd like to make and then a story I'd like to relate. The point is, is that it was wonderful this morning uh, of Jerry doing what his idea with the uh, recognizing those teach classes and so forth, and, and it, it's certainly an important part of it. But I think we're asking the wrong question. I, I don't think we should ask you how many classes you taught last year. I think the question is, is how many one-night stands did you do? Because that's where the casual dancer is. He's not in lessons. He hasn't gotten in the door yet. It's the casual bowler is a person that bowls once every six months. We don't have a square dancer that dances once every six months. And we got to start to allow those people to exist. And having one night stands that are outside of the environment of recruiting dancers for beginner lessons is one of the keys that's going to increase the real bottom of the pyramid where the casual dancer lies. We need to start thinking of that person as the bottom of the pyramid of the structure of square dancing and not the people that are taking lessons for mainstream. The other story I want to relate to you is just the whole attitude that we need to go out and change. My girlfriend is one of the most active dancers in the world, is so totally enthused with this that it's not funny. Well, so she works at a law firm. 
uh, the law firm every six months or so has a social activity. They have gone bowling together. They've done other things together. They've had basically like dance hops, and, and they've gone and done those kind of brought mates into the whole thing and, and basically functioned together. It's a very large law firm, law firm, 60 lawyers and so forth. Um, so I said, well, you know, and they're looking for other ideas to do it. I said, well, why don't you have a sport dance? Oh, they'll never do it. Now, here's a converted enthusiast that is embarrassed about her favorite hobby because she doesn't want me to, because she doesn't think ahead of time. She's made the decision for those 60 other lawyers, all their employees, and their wives and husbands that they wouldn't want to square dance. He sends the front side of your cassette. What we're facing out there, that it's really like getting a very huge rock that's sitting on, on the bottom of the hill up the hill. We've got to push it a lot harder to overcome that kind of attitude where our people are no longer embarrassed about what they do. That's very nice. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to, uh, I think I'm limited to this mic. I don't believe that one's working yet, is it? All right, so that means all of you know when you have something to say, I have to get it on this microphone. So all of you will have to have a chance to just come on up here. Show them how to say your name. My name is Barbara Burton, and I'm from Okmulgee, Oklahoma. My husband is a caller there. Oh, fabulous. How about you? I'm Colette McMullen from Calgary, Alberta. My husband is a caller there. You can tell all these guys have got great mic uh, presence. <laughs> they hold the mic just right. Okay, well, this is a period for answers and questions. And so anybody who is interested, we'd like to have come up and uh, ask your question. Or if you have a way of getting people into square dancing, uh, boy, more ideas the better. Who'd like to come up? Introduce yourself so everybody will know who you are. My name's Otto Waterman, and I'm going to tell you I do over 30 one-night stands a year. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you uh, one place to look on the Internet. Call up your college. Look under student organizations. Look under religious organizations within the student organizations, and there'll be at least 70 different denominations. I just did the Baptist Student Union at LSU, the Baptist Student Union the next night at Texas A&M, and the Baptists are dancing. I am telling you, uh, I call for Baptist churches where there's 500 to 600 on the floor. Houston's First Baptist Church in, has 6,000 single adults, and they dance. They have a dance party three times a year, square dance, one night stands. Here's another deal, something to sell besides the health. This is what you're going to have to sell with the church. We go through life, and it's a long road. And if we go down this road, and we can't go down it by ourselves, but if we go down that road with Christians, or people of the same belief, it's a lot straighter road, and it's a lot easier. The Baptist Church is selling the kids on the fact that they need to depend on each other to make the, the travel through life much smoother. That's the reason why all these camps, all these youth camps now, have what they call the ropes course. Have you all ever heard of a ropes course? It's where you're standing on cables and you're leaning against another one and walking down the cable and you're depending on ten people to catch you if you fall. Square dancing makes eight people work as one. And that's what the Baptist Church is using to sell togetherness. Square dancing, if you use mixers, takes 300 kids, 150 boys, the ability to dance with 150, each boy will dance with 150 different girls before the night's over. And kids have farm clicks. This breaks the click down. Thank you. All right. Yeah, give them a nice hand. Who else has something they'd like to ask a question about or like to make a comment? Okay. Be sure to introduce yourself. Uh, my name's John Callahan. 
uh, I've been doing community dances for many years, and uh, just last year I ran into another group of people that I never considered at all, and that was bereavement groups. These were people who had lost their loved one, and after two months or so, they have a coming out party. Square dancing works great for them. That's an interesting one that I'm sure many of you thought of, of before. Okay, some more people that have uh, ideas or can come up and help share some of these things with us. A question? Don't be bashful. I never heard a bunch of callers talk. Well, this is soft. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Alan Evans from London, England. Um, this isn't, I suppose, actually getting people new into square dancing, but um, it's an idea that sort of worked for us. We have a club which was now about so 16 years old, just over 16 years old, um, and numbers were dwindling a lot we've had a lot of people over the years and numbers were dwindling for whatever reason um and round about our 16th birthday just before we had our 16th birthday dance uh, we sent out letters to all past members that were around in the area still and some that weren't in the area still and said we're having a special evening uh, we're calling it our sweet 16 dance because it was appropriate for then and we had probably, well, we tripled the number of the uh, size of the club that particular evening. And out of it, we've now got another three or maybe four couples, which in a, in a small club of no more than five or six squares is quite a success rate. So that's possibly something to think about rekindling the... Um, several people came to us, one or two that haven't actually um, stayed with us, but they said to us, it was so great that you're still thinking of us and you still know who we are so we're getting people back that way they're passing the message on that's possibly a way of approaching it thank you very much oh yeah give them a nice hand for getting up here we have to encourage everybody to take a minute and get up here well let me see Dana you had something that you wanted to make a comment about Mike mentioned a while ago the three activities that are actually looking for us looking for something like square dancing. There's a fourth one out there that's very important, I think. I'm just now getting started with it. It's homeschooling. Homeschooling. They're looking for an activity like we are because they, they have to have social groups together with other homeschooling people. They have to have something recreational. They have to have it social. So it's part of their curriculum. They're looking for square dancing. So get with your Board of Education, find out where these homeschooling programs are, and offer your service. Family groups right there waiting for us. Okay. Second thing I'd like to point out, one of the clubs I called for did a city appreciation night. And what they did was in, they had invited the mayor and all the city members they could to come to the dance. And they did. They had the newspaper there. They had the TV cameras there. The newspaper put a two-page full uh, article in the Sunday paper, pictures and everything. Ended up very good publicity for the whole group and very well done. TV cameras was there, reported on the evening's news, good publicity again. So think about it. It wasn't all that hard. We even had the mayor up dancing. That was made the front page. So. <laughs> Great. Okay, how about somebody else? Yes. Thank you. I'm Gene Record from uh, Highland Heights, Kentucky, and I'm not sure whether the... Uh, the the jury is still out on this but in october this past october one of the callers in our area went to the cable company and learned how to do all the photography and the working the cameras and the audio and stuff and so he he got some of the callers to come out and cures and we produced a half hour program um it went over very well and uh, each six weeks they're they're bringing in a different caller and a different cure and doing a half hour program. The cable company is now showing it on a regular basis from 12 to 12.30 on Sundays and 6 to 6.30 on Tuesday evenings. And now they have asked the, this caller that's been promoting this if uh, maybe uh, in July they would do a full hour program. 
So the cable companies are happy with it. We don't know whether it's going to uh, result in getting more people into square dancing, but uh, I have a number of people. I did one of them, and they said, oh, we saw you on TV. Boy, that was really neat what you guys were doing. Um, so maybe maybe that's something that you can look at to in your area to bring it out in front of the public. Wow, you guys are something else about staying on the topics. You're doing great. I, you know, there's one side effect of that that you probably haven't really encountered, but my daughter did through the same kind of principle. Um, my daughter, 17, is involved in square dancing and, and got there on her own, by the way. I didn't teach her. I didn't push her. She decided to square dance on her own. Nevertheless, um, and of course, she has the same problem. All of her contemporaries are square dancing. Yeah. Well, that, that little community type program that occurred on her cable channel gave her an opportunity to show her friends what square dancing looked like without having to drag them to another event. So, you know, she couldn't get them out the event, she couldn't make them do a one night stand, but she could turn on the TV or at least videotape it and show them what it looked like. So this, the other side effect of that kind of thing is, is that it gives the dancers out there ammunition to be able to do something with when they try to recruit one on one. It, Jim mentioned something really interesting this morning when he got on his initial introduction was that a 12 step program. You know, when I listen to everybody talk around here, everybody's got tons of ideas about where we find dancers, where we find one night stands and what we can do to produce these things. Seems to me that it's just like somebody that's very, very depressed and doesn't take advantage of all the people. If, if they've broken up in a relationship, they're now depressed and there's no one in the world out there for them. They, there are lots of signal organizations, there's lots of places to meet people, it's all around them, they just can't get off their duff to do something about it. And it seems to me that a lot of both our square dance clubs and our square dance callers aren't getting out there and finding out what's available. It isn't that it isn't there and that we have to make it, it's there, we're not taking advantage of it. Okay, there got to be somebody over on this side. I think I've had everybody from this side just about so far. Good, there's a taker. And the summer rest of you be thinking about it because our time starts to run short and I can get two or three people in if you're all ready. Rick Dillon in Tucson, Arizona. Um, one of the things we, we, we happen to have a, an advantage on in Tucson is we have our own hall. So uh, we got together and we decided um, not just to sell square dancing, but we had a dance jamboree where we invited ballroom dancing, we invited cloggers, we invited round dancing, and it was free, and all the instructors in Tucson that were available came out and donated their time, and it was a way of getting people into the hall, and maybe they didn't come for square dancing, maybe they came because they interested in ballroom dancing, but then they got up and square danced, and we had oh, 120, 130 people in the hall, and out of that, we probably only got 10 people, but that was 10 more people that would not have come just for square dancing. They came for ballroom dancing or contras, and, and it's just a way of, uh, I don't want to use the word tricking people into coming to square dancing, but one of the things I've felt that we should do is, is have an event and have square dancing as part of the event, not just square dancing. And it, it's a way of getting people into the hall that may have not come in the first place. It's just an idea that it really worked well for us. Sounds like a good one, too. Okay, who else? Come on. You know, every one of you has some fabulous ideas and some great answers after years and years and years of working at this. Come on, share them with us. Hi, I'm Dick Peterson, Baltimore 2000. There's a lot of things in marketing that um, have been brought up in here. And there's two types of marketing. There's negative marketing and there's positive marketing. And what I see in square dancing is, is both types. You've got the successful clubs that do the positive marketing. You've got the negative clubs that say it can't be done. And I think that's where the line gets drawn along with the apathy toward in the center line over here. And I think more effort has to be put on it can be done rather than it can't be done. You go to a successful club 
and you find that the club does a lot of things to promote square dancing. They're out in the crowds. They're doing all the things that you're talking about. They're doing the first nighters. They're they're promoting themselves and they're promoting square dancing. Then you have the other club who used to be successful, who is no longer successful, and they're doing absolutely nothing. And this this is where the difference lies between the the building the building of of, a, of something that we all love very dearly, which is square dancing, and and the apathy and on the other end. And I think what we have to do is light the fire under the apathy and let them know that they had fun 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and they're still having fun, and they ought to get it, the message out to everybody else that it still is fun. And that's where the fire needs to be lit on the grassroots, or as you keep saying, the base of the pyramid. Well, and let me get a cheap, crass commercial announcement in here. Dick is the chairman of the general chairman of the 2000 National in Baltimore. I'm his vice chairman of programming. Uh, four other members of the Board of Governors were on that program committee. The only way that we will be successful is if both dancers and callers work hand in hand. And here's an example. I think we could do it. Let me take just a minute to go back over uh, a couple of points for you. One for you to think about. In square dancing, as I mentioned earlier, we've focused in on a particular group of people and almost all that we do hits those people. Um, you may not realize it, but there's only one program in square dancing that can help make us grow. Only the basic program of the ones that we mainly work with recruit and teach people who've never square danced before. Every other program, mainstream takes from the basic program, uh, plus takes from the mainstream program. So they are taking the same people who are already square dancers in one program and moving them to another, which instead of increasing the, amount of, the number of people we've got, often decreases it. it the, the clubs they're taking them from are all getting smaller and dying. There's only one club one program basically that deals with people who have never square danced before on a regular basis and that's the basic program now the message from that should say to us that it's important that we work with um, the program that's going to recruit new people that program should be the largest program by far in square dancing and it's the tiniest now, I have to tell you, down here at this meeting, I've been really impressed by the number of things I'm finding people doing about the basic program and the mainstream program. So I think maybe finally we're getting a message that we've got to do something beside plus and advanced. In my neck of the woods, why people won't even go to a dance if it's not a plus or advanced one, put on mainstream or basic, and they stay home. Although we did do something last year that I was proud about because we started a weekend basic and mainstream in a resort that everything else is advanced with a little bit of plus and uh, we had a great turnout and the nicest thing all night was a whole people, bunch of people came in Friday night and said we just came over to dance with you tonight tomorrow we've got a big plus dance we're going to before they left that night they walked over and said we're coming back here tomorrow night and they did they left the plus dance and came over because of the basic and mainstream program. And so I think there's room, but this is the only one in that whole area up there that even talks about doing something with basics. We can have a great time with those programs. Those calls are super, and you can, a good choreographer can have a lot of fun. But uh, one other message in that, I've made for my own uh, purposes a commitment to the idea that my major presentations to people should come away with them saying, wow, that was easy, and I had a lot of fun. And I don't want anybody coming around telling me the thing we're trying to do with the basic program is make it challenging. Try to make it harder. Uh, I, not for me. For me, good rhythm and beautiful music and a caller that has an empathy with that floor 
can take very simple things and make them wonderful dancing. Just think, if you will, just think. How long have you been ballroom dancing? If any of you ballroom dance, how many of you ever took a lesson in ballroom dancing? You know, I looked at my high school. When I was a junior in high school, I had one lady who was nice enough to take me for two or three dances and teach me a little something about ballroom dancing. I haven't learned another thing since then, and I used to go to dances regularly every Saturday night. I don't have to learn a bunch of new things to have a good time at a, at a nice dance with good music, good band. So think a little bit about this business of finding ways to zero in on the point that you're going to try for easy things that are a lot of fun. And, uh, boy, that, that one-night stand deal they had last night in there was fabulous. Boy, good all the way through, just simple. But was it good? Okay, who else has got a... Uh, Bill Packard, Oklahoma City. I belonged, I call for a club that uh, is called Easy Level, and that's all we do. We do Easy Level calling. People can come back that have been out of dancing for 10 years and come to that club and call and dance. And uh, we have people that get out of lessons that uh, really they do 12, 14, 15 lessons. They're not ready for uh, regular club dancing. We have them come there and uh, we teach them mainstream and easy level dancing. And uh, that's, I don't call plus. I don't even get into that. I call this easy stuff and I want to keep people in here. They want to get into plus. That's the first thing out of lessons. They go plus. And uh, I encourage them to at least dance for a while. They have fun and stay in the activity. We lose a lot of people out of lessons, and they get them into plus. They're going from lessons to lessons. Uh, I don't know. I just want to keep them in there where they have fun. And I have a lot of people that just want to dance that level of dancing. Thank you. Come on, who's next? We gotta have ah, good. Meg Ferguson from Saratoga, California. My husband Keith is a caller, and I had a question for Jim about one night stands. Um, there's been a lot of talk about clothing, you know, the petticoats and so forth, scaring people away. Uh, you made some comment about costume this morning. I was wondering what you would recommend for the caller and his wife or partner um, uh, to wear to one night stands as a marketing person. You know, I, I got to tell you that in, in this survey, I can talk about how that's okay. No, no, we need to get you on the mic. Sorry, Sorry I didn't say that. Uh, just real quick, because it is interesting, every woman I talked to in my survey uh, that was not a dancer, uh, almost every time, always ask, are they still wearing those short-waisted outfits? Um, and yet, when I, the more I did this, the more I realized that that really wasn't the issue for them. And, and so to prove that, I went back to, 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 and did research on about four of Mike's class graduates, different groups. Every 17 weeks, he kicks out a new bunch. and. Inevitably, in the 15 or 20 people in those classes that are graduating, there's always two or three women who absolutely have told me from the beginning, because I always ask, I'm always curious and find out, that they will not wear that outfit. And 90% of those women who did not, within six months to nine months, have come back around and in fact have bought the outfit. I don't think it's the outfit. That's just a red herring that they use. Doesn't mean you don't have to, whoever asked that question, uh, that doesn't mean you don't have to you don't have to address that issue. I like the idea of being proud of what you've got on, very much so. And that doesn't mean, you know, that, that you can't also be proud. I was going to, one of the things we were going to do this time, we didn't get a chance to do it, was a fashion show for women with some of the new looks that are available in Western look. I mean, it's incredible what they're doing these days. And, and, and so certainly that would be appropriate. A good new look would be appropriate for the woman, I would think. What you're selling again, is, you know, is not the form. I keep going back to this, folks, and it's the message and the content, which is what keeps coming out here. 
the form doesn't matter in the long run. It matters. Form is important. And that's why I don't think the, it matters that much as long as the content and the message have been, have been put out the right way. Now, I don't know how to say this, but believe me, people know the difference in the final analysis. Whether, and, and it won't be the complaint about the dress. It won't be the complaint about this or the hat or the outfit. On the contrary, uh, if you use that the right way, as they've already suggested here, in a positive way, uh, then that can be a positive. If the other isn't there, if the content and the message isn't with this, then the form won't matter one way or the other. But they're both important. I don't know. If Thank you. I have some definite feelings on what you should wear in one night stands and those things because we've done some little research on this over the years. I'm Mike Seastrom from California. And the, what we find is that when you take a group out to do a demonstration and you, everybody's dressed up in their club outfit or their fanciest square dance outfit, and you go out and try to get others to join you. You know, you, you call a little bit, you do a little bit of a demo, and then you try to get your dancers to go out and get a partner. If they're dressed to the T, they'll have a harder time getting those people to come up and join them and dance than if you have a diversive dress in all your people that are there for the demo. If you have some of them in square dance dress, maybe some of them in, in western attire, pleated skirts have come back just marvelously. There's a lot of pleated outfits out there and things that are just like dance things, things that you'd see ladies in in a, in a business atmosphere or in any other type of atmosphere. And if you diversify the dress in your group, they don't look as professional. The people that are watching it don't say, God, I could never do that because these guys are professionals. They look like a more diverse group. They look like the group that you're appealing to. I feel like the more that you get them to wear things that these people would already have in their closet, the easier they'll come to your dance in your class. If they're dressed to the tee and everybody's in their fanciest outfits, you'll not only have a hard time getting them to come up and join you during the demo, but you'll have a, a harder time getting them in the class. Our class that, that, that are, are, we have a whole diverse group in our angels. Some of them wear class outfits. Some of them wear just anything, but as the class progresses, the angels more and more wear their club outfits or wear their regular outfits, and you see the dancers start to do the same thing. We even have a program with our class that about halfway through the first phase of the class, we have what we call, uh, it's called a clothes rack. We dance in a church, and there's a room off to the side, and everybody from the club gathers clothes that they no longer fit into and, and things like that. And, and one of the gals, or a couple of the gals from the clubs, sew them and they press them and they clean them and they, you know, and we hang them up and we make a rack and we sell the clothes for like next to nothing. A shirt's five bucks, so it, you know, so our dancers can go in there and look around. If they want to spend five bucks and get a shirt, you know, it's okay, they can. If they don't, that's no big deal. We don't make it any, you know, the club gets the money, the money just goes in the club's treasury, and it's a real subtle sort of thing, and it's there maybe once a month in the latter part of the classes going along, but we find by halfway point, or by even close to graduation, as Jim said, that more and more of them kind of like dressing up. They kind of like the feeling of that twirling around, that skirts. And it gives me the opportunity when we do demos on the floor between tips to show them some of the styling and how to work the skirts. And the more they feel comfortable doing that, the more they'll come around. So the less of an issue we make it and the more we show them that there's a, there's a wide range of styles out there, and there is a wide range of styles, and things are changing, and the dress just as it always has, as this activity has evolved, it makes it happen a little bit easier becomes less of a stumbling block. Thanks, Jack. Thanks. Yeah, very nice. I want to make sure all of you, uh, I want to get on the tape because I didn't put this on earlier, the title for this particular uh, session, How to Find Them, where, where Do They Come From, is the session title. And uh, get that on the tape so it'll be there if you want to pick up a copy of that tape. Uh, I have about two minutes, three minutes left. Uh, either of you guys want? All right. All right. I'm going to throw one at you. Did Mike leave? I cannot understand. I've been in direct sales for 32 years, straight commission salesman. I cannot understand how a National Square Dance Convention and how Caller Lab can have conventions and have all this talent and not utilize it with the general public of the town that they're in. Baltimore. It would behoove you to get with your public school district 
and get the school teachers for our clinic and have the kids for our one-nighters and have the best callers in the country calling it. But the Nationals now charge an arm and a leg for a non-dancer and they have to wear square dance clothes. That's just, that just, yeah. But see, you've got the opportunity and I've never understood that. And I've never understood why Caller Lab has these meetings and great, the best callers in the country, in the world for doing one-nighters are here and we don't utilize it with the people in the town that they're in. Y'all need to get it on. <laughs> Thank you. Billy Harrison has given me a three-hour lecture on doing this, and uh, he sent me about 25 emails, and he will not let up until we have some kind of a big outside affair in Baltimore in 2000. I guarantee it'll be there. <laughs> Fabulous. That's great. That's great. Put on something you might rival Seattle. We were up there in Seattle as part of the program when they uh, set the Guinness World Record for the largest number of square dancers to dance to one caller. And uh, as far as I know, that's never been touched. It was 15,000 at that time. And uh, you might even, if you were doing something like this, you can't tell, you might be able to fit that in together. A bunch of my schools wanted to do that, but then I found out they only have one record, one Guinness record, nobody else can get that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, John Callahan, uh, when are we going to get away from one night stands? In my area, it has very bad connotations. I quit calling them one night. I quit calling them one night stands in my area. They're country party dances, uh, and that's what I've been using now for three, four years. So I imagine other people have some good suggestions, and I agree. I think that it would be good to change to another name. Thank you, Jack. First of all, uh, what, how about a big hand for Jack Murtha, our moderator for the day? Appreciate working with him. The second thing I'd like to do is leave you with this one thought. I look at doing lessons as an opportunity. How many has heard that? I'm sure you all heard the term, I'm waiting for my ship to come in, referring to I'm waiting for my opportunity. Well, folks, if you're still sitting around waiting for an opportunity to teach a class, that ship may never come in. Get in the water and swim out and get them. Better yet, take a rowboat with your equipment and get on the boat and start calling there. We've got to start turning the tide and working to get classes somehow. And the best way is to take the proactive side of it and start working for your dancers, showing them how to sell square dancing. I thank you for letting us talk with these guys. The best way that we can sell is be enthusiastic. I can't think of a better example of enthusiasm than Jack's emceeing of this affair today. If you've been to these things before where it's been very hard to get anybody to speak when we bring the microphone to you, Jack persuaded you to come up here. You smiled as he tried to encourage you and so forth, and you kind of laughed about it, but you came up and joined. And it was his enthusiasm that did it, and that's the kind of enthusiasm we need to sell. Wow, I'll tell you. Well, I have one story to leave you with. Very famous caller was quoted in our article about this session, Ed Gilmore. Ed Gilmore, I don't know how many of you knew Ed Gilmore. Put your hand up. Not very many. And uh, it's a fascinating thing uh, to think that uh, some of our callers and leaders really don't know much about the people who got all this going. I sat in a callers class with Vaughn Parrish and somehow or another in the middle of the class he thought about, he says, How, is there anybody here that knows anything about Lloyd Shaw? No hands went up. They didn't have a single person who even knew the name. And he says, that's the last time that's going to happen. Every one of his caller schools from then on is going to talk about some of those historical giants. Well, Ed Gilmore was one. He was one of the first callers in one of the uh, callers' classes, virtually started that whole concept. But one little story about them indicates what a tremendous leader he was. Um, 
this is a story somebody told me and said this is about the strangest uh, square dance class that anybody could have ever held. It turned out that Ed Gilmore got sick and they took him to the hospital. Well, he was due to teach a class while he was in the hospital. And they said all of a sudden, the hospital just started filling up with people. All these folks coming up, they walked up to his room, and one at a time, they walked in the room to take their lesson from Ed Gilmore. <laughs> and he had this whole great big bunch of people, one after another, every class member got a chance to come in and say he had and kind of encourage him a little bit. So uh, we really have a, a history that's fabulous. We've got a lot of things that you'd be very interested in. So I really appreciate today you taking time to come to this session. Mike Seesman, I just want to add one more thing about Ed Gilmore, because if you get on the Internet, you can get a copy of a, uh, of a, of a caller seminar that Ed gave in California, 1954, and you just print it right out. It's available. It's been put on there in its entirety, and you want to print it out and look at how much that whole seminar applies today. And it was Ed Gilmore's lesson plan. It's beautiful. It's on the Internet, and it's just excellent. I'll have to get that. <laughs> all right. Our time is all up, and we want to really, again, say thank you for choosing this and coming in with us. We we'll look forward to getting to work with you some more as we go through the convention.